very good good morning good afternoon and good evening to all um, i hope everyone has had a very great day or is starting a very good day uh, welcome to each one of you for this uh, second session of the gsdc global clo summit uh, my name is Setole and i will be your host for today my co-host uh, Imtiran La is also here. If you require any assistance during the session, please feel free to uh, reach out to us and ping us on the chat box. We will be happy to assist you whenever you require any assistance. Um, I see that a lot of people who had joined yesterday have joined today as well. So happy to see you. Uh, welcome to those who, have, who are joining today uh, first time. Uh, we had a really good session with um, with Ellen yesterday and uh, looking forward to, to the session as well. It's very exciting. I hope that everyone will stick till the end and uh, yes, and, and just uh, have a really fulfilling uh, session with our speaker again. So, um, it's already we have some participants joining in. So as a join, I will begin with the introductions. Allow me to introduce our hosting uh, Okay, just before that, uh, a big thank you to our official media partner, that is World Press Up. Uh, uh, if you are here on the participant list, thank you so much for your support always and really hoping that we will continue this uh, um, here is a brief introduction about our global development council and the neutral international specification organization uh, learners find credibility in the top emerging and skill-based certifications well, we have over 60 plus certification portfolios and are also proud to be accredited by NSI and ABICB. The NSI is the American National Standards Institute and ABICB is the Accreditation Board of International Certification Bodies. Our certifications are well curated and designed by our uh, global industry experts and subject matter experts who are also academic affiliates from top universities like MIT, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and Wharton. I see some of our advisors on the participant list today. Thank you so much for joining and always thanks for your support. Um, JSDC is also partnered with over 50 plus global training partners. They are our authorized training partners uh, who add to the programs accredited by GSDC. So our ATO partners uh, come from regions like the African regions, European regions, APEC, America, and uh, Latin and Middle East. And we are so proud to be a part uh, of all these companies. Uh, if you would like to learn more about GSDC, please do have a look at our website. Uh, we have shared the link on the chat box. And you can also connect with us on LinkedIn to have more information about our services. We will be happy to connect with you. Uh, I want to take a quick opportunity here to thank our uh, ATO partners, supporters, who have uh, went ahead of their of their way to um, share the, the event to their network personally and through the company as well. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being here as well. I see you here. Thank you, and yes, uh, I hope that our uh, partnership connection continues uh, even stronger for moving further from here. Also not forgetting our individual supporters, the volunteers who stepped up to share our events uh, on their personal link, on their pro personal profile. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And if anyone is missing here, please forgive me and uh, please know that we appreciate each one of you. Just before I go towards our speaker, I uh, just wanted to have a quick intro about the uh, Chief Learning Officer Certificate by GSDC and also about the LND Certificate 
So these certificates are uh, by GSDC. If you listen to the sessions and you get interested in these uh, modules, I would request each one is to have a look at the GSDC certifications. We provide uh, live training, uh, expert talk series, and e-learnings as well. Uh, the certificates are globally recognized and uh, have and are uh, and has a lifetime validity. So, if you are interested, uh, we have shared the link on the chat box. Please do have a look. And if you require any assistance, you can come come to us personally as well, and we will be more than happy to uh, guide you through this part. Okay, uh, we do have in, uh, a lot of participants right now. As more participants join, allow me to quickly introduce our speaker for today. We are so honored to have our uh, speaker for today that is Mr. Alistair Gordon. He is the CEO of two consulting firms that is Expertunity and HFL Leadership. He was a senior coach in both Expertunity and Leadership and is a master facilitator of both. Uh, just before I give him the time, uh, we will be having a 15-minute Q&A session before the, uh, after the presentation. And uh, the speaker would also love to connect with the participants during the presentation. So feel free to use the chat box and interact with the speaker as well. So uh, Alistair, if you are ready, you can take over the screen and take your time. now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, and um, welcome everybody. Thank you for um, taking the time. Um, uh, yes, I'm going to hit that. There we go. Um, so I'm hoping that everybody can um, see that presentation. So um, uh, the, the purpose of um, the, my, my presentation today really is to share um, some of our experiences over the last four to five years of working with technical experts and, and the impact they have on the organizations that they work with and how um, talent teams and, and CLOs um, interact with those experts and support the nurture of those experts. And um, we're hoping that we're going to be able to share with you some experiences that um, perhaps you can deploy in your own markets. Um, if you're an expert, I'm hoping there will be um, some content that will help you in terms of your personal development. If you're running a consultancy, there seems to be a number of you who, who do that in this great network um, that I'm talking to now. Very happy to talk to you about supporting any activities you wanted to do in your markets. Um, so it's very much a, a sharing um, scenario. I, I should say that some of the content of my presentation um, uh, is a little controversial. Sometimes the learning and development um, community don't agree with some of the things that we're saying. And um, as um, uh, uh, Satoru said, very happy to take uh, comments and questions as we go through. There's some natural breaks in the presentation, so feel free to put questions um, into the chat. Um, and then I'll, I'll come to um, Satoru occasionally to um, uh, ask if there are any questions. So without further ado, I might just kick on quickly. Um, um, so this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking a little bit about me, very little bit. Um, um, talk about technical subject matter experts in overall context, um, explore the nature and the nurture of subject matter experts, um, and also you know, make some suggestions as to what we've discovered might be a reasonably new approach to talent identification, particularly of experts, you know, and what is best practice and next practice in terms of um, organizations um, developing their technical expertise in their organization. And for the purposes of um, this this presentation, uh, we just in that box there on the right hand side, we're, we're talking about really two definitions of leadership. And um, the first one is what we call capital L leadership, which is leading people and leading teams and what have you. And I know that during the CLO conference, there's a number of themes themed conversations around leadership development and what the best practice leadership development looks like. Um, there's also this concept of small L leadership, which is where individual contributors act in informal leadership roles and so on. And when it comes to subject matter experts, um, you know, we call that expertship. And one of the reasons that we've deployed the, the word expertship is because 
uh, through our research, a lot of technical experts don't want to attend or be involved in leadership initiatives because they don't want to be people leaders. They want to be thought leaders. They want to be technical gurus. Um, they can't imagine anything worse, actually, than having to, to manage people. And we found that the leadership word is a real, um, you know, puts them off wanting to engage with some of the activities and, and uh, programs and content that we have. So um, that's one of the reasons that we use expertship. And, and I'll, I'll talk through that a little bit more uh, in a moment. Why should you listen to me? Well, um, I've had a, a checkered career here. I was a student leader, a corporate executive for a long time in a large organization. Um, a successful entrepreneur built a couple of publishing businesses, um, then invested in a number of entrepreneurial things that didn't work. Um, my, my advice to all of you out there who are entrepreneurial is it's, it's, that's the right order to get it in. Be successful first and unsuccessful later. That's helpful. Um, now running a couple of uh, very successful businesses that I'll describe a little bit. And, and really my, my key role now, and one of the reasons that I'm very grateful for your attendance and, and this invite to talk to this esteemed audience is that you know, I'm really um, become a missionary. I'm really keen to help technical experts around the world really fulfill their potential and add the value they really could add to their organizations and their communities. And, and you'll gather from the fact that I, I'm devoting some time to doing that, that I don't think most of them currently are fulfilling their potential. And uh, that's one of the themes that I want to explore through this, this process. Um, the other thing I'll be sharing is that we have, as I mentioned, over the last four or five years, been spending a lot of time with subject matter experts. So um, we've had, you know, over to 2000 on our programs, we've done, you know, thousands of coaching sessions with technical experts, lots and lots of assessments. And myself and sort of three or four other key facilitators around the world have, have spent 10,000 training days with technical experts. So I'd like to think that that gives you at least some sense that we um, have quite a lot of experience dealing with technical experts from all sorts of um, knowledge domains. So IT probably make up about 50%, um, but we have scientists, uh, we have weapons inspectors, we have um, finance people, risk people, um, just uh, lawyers, just a whole range um, of different specialists, all, all of these people being high value individual technical contributors in their organizations. Most of the people we've had on the programs have been medium and large organizations, uh, but increasingly we're beginning to get people from small organizations as well. So the purpose of this session is to share what we've learned um, and really keen to see whether our experiences, which are mostly Asia Pacific, but we also have run programs in North America and Europe and um, uh, certainly uh, across Asia. Um, I'm interested to see whether or not um, our experiences um, relate to the sort of experiences that you've had. So why are technical experts increasingly strategically important? Um, you know, I think uh, there's a whole range of issues that all of you will be very familiar with. You know, globalization, increasing technical complexity, of pretty much everything. The global pandemic um, has really focused um, a lot of people and governments on getting expert advice and indeed the fact that the expert advice varies from expert to expert. Um, climate change is having a huge impact in terms of needing more technical solutions. Um, you know, uh, the STEM supply and demand in terms of, um, you know, most, a, a lot of organizations, a lot of countries are really struggling to develop the number of technical experts they really need. New hybrid ways of working have changed the way that um, uh, experts and their organizations interact and then the exponential you know, growth of um, just you know, complexity and what have you. So we, 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 our view is that when I think about when we started working with technical experts, say five or six years ago, um, you know, they were perceived as reasonably important by their organizations. Today, I think that's changed a lot. Um, certainly in the organizations in the areas of the world that we work most, um, now there is a, a real challenge to retain the technical experts that they have for most large organizations. Um, there's a, a major issue to try and, you know, find them, new experts, particularly given that the pandemic has stopped a lot of um, uh, mobility in terms of employment, and um, it's opening up a little bit now. 
Um, and, and suddenly organizations are discovering that they're, they're really dependent on technical experts. Quite often, you know, groups of technical experts who do work that's quite unseen until suddenly, um, you know, that, that work is not um, being done properly. So we're finding in our client base that um, people are beginning to really take a look at what they're doing for technical experts or not doing, as the case may be, to a much greater extent than they were maybe three or four years ago. I'd be interested to know whether that's what you're seeing as well. So what's the current situation for most experts? Um, uh, um, we, I think our research suggests that um, if you're a generalist in an organization, um, you experience um, technical experts in a variety of ways. And I think one of the ways for us to describe the, the, the journey we've been on is to you know, introduce you to Kim. Um, so Kim is a Unix engineer um, based in one of our clients. He was one of our early participants on um, our programs um, around expertship. He was a Unix engineer, 15 years tenure, um, technical subject matter expert, um, you know, a real sort of super, super technical. Um, but he had, he had, because of the way that he operated and communicated and what have you, he, he really operated in a technical bubble. And as a consequence of that, um, tended to come across as being very dismissive of those with less knowledge and experience. Um, generally wasn't very good with people, particularly non-technical people. Kim really struggled to communicate with people outside his um, you know, uh, IT expertise. He, he was liable to get very angry with colleagues when they did the wrong thing. He was the expert in relation to the Unix um, applications in his organization, which were fundamental and mission critical. And uh, he used to get very, um, very upset when people broke his systems for one reason or another. He was quite dismissive of management, um, privately very dismissive of, of corporate management. And, and, and regularly, um, I discovered, um, you know, had a bit of a reputation for being very dismissive of senior leadership um, uh, in front of senior leadership. Um, uh, he, he famously once said to his chief financial officer, um, when he was asking for an extra funds to update some um, Unix licenses, um, the CFO asked him why it was necessary, and, and Kim's response was, "Look, it, it, you know, it would just take too long to explain it to you, and you, you probably wouldn't understand. You're probably not smart enough to understand why we need them. So just give me the money." And you can imagine that um, that went down very poorly. Um, he he was very resistant to any non-technical training. You know, his view very much was that he, um, you know, was, was you know, uh, 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 an expert already as expert as he could possibly be. And certainly in his organization, he knew more about the Unix applications than anybody else. Um, he was a single point of failure. Um, you know, basically if he didn't fix it, um, if, you know, and that, that made him unfireable. So a lot of people didn't know what he was doing most of the time. A lot of his work was undocumented. Um, and he had no time to spend on what we call knowledge transfer or mentoring, you know, teaching other people, you know, what he did. And, and as a consequence, of, as a generalist, um, you know, he was a good example of how, you know, narrow specialists are experienced, which is the sort of list of um, attributes down the left-hand side, if you can call them attributes you know they, they you know kim was very regularly ignored and then every now and then when something really important happened he was rolled out and he had to explain what was going on and then he went he was sent back into the it department you know buried somewhere um at the bottom of his organization so um his his view was um that he was as good as he could be as an expert um his view was that the organization um uh, you know, treated him very badly, he didn't realize how valuable the work he did was. And um, he'd, he'd been there for, you know, a long period of time and was beginning to get, you know, upset with the organization and what have you. So, <clears throat> let's move on to the next slide. So, and, 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 you know, the rationale for this was that the typical development for experts is that they spend an enormous amount of time developing their technical skills and they super invest in those, but they, they under invest in building, um, you know, the sort of broader enterprise, what we call enterprise skills. And I'll give you a sense of what that, those are at the moment. So, um, you know, what, what do the very best technical experts do? Well, most of them are very good at technical capability. So expert knowledge, um, some of them are good at knowledge transfer, some aren't. 
they're very good at coming up with solutions and what have you. And, um, you know, these are the technical skills that we describe. This is a capability framework we call the expertship model, which underpins all of our work. And, and um, any of you will be able to get access to um, this framework um, from us if, if you want to. Very happy to share it. Um, we didn't really want to build our own capability framework, but we couldn't find another one anywhere else that, um, uh, you know, did the job. The, the trouble with Kim and a lot of experts like him is that he wasn't aware really that the, um, you know, there were other things that he needed to learn. So, um, you know, the, the three capabilities we have here, stakeholder engagement, collaboration, personal impact, what we call the relationship domain, you know, most experts that we've worked with, those 2,300 experts that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, some of them are quite good with relationships. Some of them are very poor. Um, they tend to be very good with relationships with other technical groups that are in adjacent fields. And, and the more generalist the, uh, the people they're dealing with, they, they tend to be less good with the relationship domain. And the other area where there is a real paucity is what we call the value domain. So market context, value impact and change impact. And I can go into these in more detail if you're interested, but um, th this is really the context in, in which they're operating. And m most of you, I think, have probably got a lot of experience um, in working with leaders and, and organizations. You'll know that um, unless you've got an external focus, like a market context, and you understand how value is created in your organization and your market and your industry, then you can't really innovate. You can't add extra value as um, experts. And most of the surveys that we've done testing the capabilities of technical experts we've worked with, um, the experts get marked quite low in that value um, domain. And, and that's because, you know, and it is, there's three levels of um, expertship that we've defined inside that capability framework. There's the specialist area, which is, you know, the early stage life is very tactical, very transactional. Um, there's the expert level. Um, so this is kind of like frontline leader, middle leader, you know, executive leader. You've got specialist expert um, and master expert. The experts level is, is where most of the people that we've worked with reside. Um, there's mostly tactical again, some strategic, they might have high value transactional, but still mid, you know, near or mid horizon, very departmental focus, still quite reactive. And then at the top, you have the master expert, which is, which is at the end of the day where everybody aspires to be. Um, and they get quite frustrated sometimes that they can't get up. These are people who are operating in a str strategic transformational, you know, setting the agenda, innovating, very external focus and um, when people are specialists they're you know they're, they're basically totally focused on um, the acquisition of technical skills when they're expert um, they're adding to those technical skills probably getting greater depth more complexity but they're also um, picking up a lot of experiences of problem solving and that makes them, them very valuable but at master expert um, the key area is um, you know building these enterprise skills and this is the gap that we see that in most organizations and talent programs, um, that this sort of enterprise skill development of technical experts is, is a gap and is missing and is not available for most experts in most of our client organizations. Um, and this is where organizations and those experts themselves are missing out on the opportunity to really you know, add value. And, and that's because a typical career looks like this. Um, you know, as I've described, uh, the first five or six years, the experts are, are acquiring knowledge, um, then more knowledge. But then what tends to happen, because they don't have enterprise skills um, in the later years, they tend to hit a technical ceiling. So they continue with doing the same sort of work. It becomes increasingly competitive. And in effect, they get career stuck. And when they get career stuck, this is problematic for them um, because they lose enthusiasm, they lose their energy, they get frustrated that they can't add more value. And the organization, of course, um, that they're working for, um, uh, you know, has all sorts of problems. First and foremost, they can't hang on to their experts. They can't retain them because their experts think, well, you know, maybe maybe I'll have a better opportunity to progress my career elsewhere. Um, and so they leave or they think about leaving. And of course, the organization doesn't get the benefit of that extra value add that the technical expert could add, you know, if they had um, 
you know, these enterprise skills, you know, built on. So a lot of my presentation really is going to be talking to you about, um, you know, how do um, experts themselves and how do organizations and talent teams in organizations help experts get up to this master expert level? Um, so I, what I thought I might do, um, uh, and, and just the yeah, final, final point is that, you know, for, typically um, the experts actually, um, you know, their career pathing looks like this. The, the leaders have got lots of development and, and uh, programs and lots of dollars and, and uh, uh, euros and, and what have you spent on um, developing leaders, but very little is spent on developing um, technical experts. They hit a technical ceiling and they become either a transition risk or a flight risk. Qu quite a few experts that we've worked with have gone across to try and be a leader um, they haven't had the skills or the, um, you know, development up to that point, and they've really struggled, um, or as I mentioned, they, they might leave. But whereas most organizations, what they really want to get is to give experts these three potential paths. So um, here's a question for everybody, and I'm, I'm going to encourage you to open up chat. Um, uh, and maybe I can uh, come to you, um, uh, Satolu, to see whether there are any questions at this point. But, but what I'd like to encourage people to do is to um, answer this question. I've just described the problem that experts have in terms of career pathing and, and not progressing up to that master expert level. Um, uh, why do you think experts face this career problem? You know, is it mostly nature? Um, that is to say, it's just the way experts are. Or is it nurture? Is it is it at the organisations and the talent teams and our, our strategies that we've deployed have actually made them like that? We've created that that technical um, ceiling that I just described. So I'd be very keen to get your views into chat. Um, of what you think? You know, is it nature or is it nurture? You'll notice I've added the word mostly in there. So I don't want you to say a bit of both. Which one do you think is mostly the case? Is it nature or is it nurture? And maybe I might just stop there, um, uh, Satola, and see if there are any questions. Yeah, so far, uh, there are no questions yet. Uh, there is just a recommendation by Sri Ram. He has sent some links and asked if you can have a look at uh, his doctoral research on Parag and Don's framework. So that's the only, that's okay. the only well, one we have, right? I absolutely love to do so and and hopefully um, as host you'll you'll save all the comments at the end so that we can um, we can share them so um, I'm getting the the list that are coming through here is um, uh, nurture 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 um, uh, a mix of both um, but um, uh, you know we've got mostly um, mostly nurture and um, that gives me a good sense of um, how um, informed the audience is because having worked with 2300 experts i can guarantee you that it is definitely nurture um, and not nature um, once um, technical experts actually understand what the benefits of um, uh, mastering enterprise skills as well as um, technical skills are once they understand how those enterprise skills get rid of the barriers that creates that technical ceiling, um, they are able to acquire the enterprise skills very rapidly um, and, and deploy them very quickly and very effectively and significantly make um, you know, a big difference to both their own careers and, and their organizations. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and Sasha, I think your point about um, you know, the characteristics that, that occasionally um, you know, come into play. We'll talk about those in a moment because I think what you're you're um, alluding to is quite right. Um, uh, I, I would, you know, it's a broad a broad statement, but I would say that eighty percent of the technical experts that we've worked with um, are, are quite highly introverted, and as a consequence of that, they um, are they they're quite quiet. They don't speak up uh, very much. They don't necessarily communicate um, uh, as well as they could do. And, and as a consequence, we, we end up with a lot of people who are not technical experts and are extrovert um, are, you know, tend to 
get the wrong impression of actually what their capability and their, their contribution is. So if we agree it's like nurture um, that is the problem and not nature, then we have to ask ourselves what, what's going wrong um, because this, this you know, shouldn't be the case. I mentioned sort of, you know, sort of 90% to 10% is pretty much our, our research. So um, this, is, this is where occasionally, um, you know, my comments are, are, are less well received by talent and L&D people. And I apologize if um, you disagree with, with these uh, points. And of course there are many opinions are available. Um, but the, the first culprit for me as to why um, nurture is not being done for experts as successfully as it should be done in many, many organizations, um, I, I might just say that there are there's particular segments of the market, certain leading IT companies absolutely have wonderful programs for their technical experts and what have you. Um, the... Um, uh, the, the other sector that um, uh, seems to, to us to have quite a lot of really good advanced programs for developing the broader skills of their technical experts is engineering companies. Um, so those, those tend to be the, the, the two main areas. But the first culprit, I think, um, on the basis of our learning over the last four or five years is organisational bias. And, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that um, technical experts sometimes, um, as I mentioned with Kim, um, um, don't advertise themselves as positively as they could do. Um, and as a consequence, um, you know, they, they are perceived as not open to learning. I mentioned that Kim was very resistant to um, learning about enterprise skills. He didn't, doesn't believe that you know, enterprise skills at that stage in his career was, was going to be any benefit to him. So he pushes back on, on those sorts of things. Um, Kim, Kim had a, a moment where the... Um, uh, HR business partner in his organization um, nominated him to go along for an emotional intelligence course. Um, no one told him why, but he, you know, he's smart enough to understand that, you know, he goes around upsetting people quite a bit. Um, and, you know, his, his view was that, you know, an emotional intelligence was an irrelevance to the work that he did as a unit engineer. and It wasn't required and what have you. So I think um, for a lot of reasons um, in a lot of organizations, you know, they do perceive um, experts as being off to the side and not really mainstream. And, and you know, they're happy in their technical bubble um, and let's just leave them there. Um, the truth is they're not happy in their technical bubble. And, um, you know, we need, we need to understand that. Um, culprit number two is, you know, probably a bit more controversial, which is Alan D's obsession with leadership. So um, the enormously large number of people that I talk to in the early years of developing this capability, these enterprise skill programs and what have you, a lot of them would be more junior learning and development people. So probably less like the people we have on this on this call who are very experienced, but junior L&D people just really were focused on leadership programs and what have you and, and, and couldn't understand why we would want to teach what they perceive as leadership skills to um, technical experts. I mean, why would they be interested? And of course they'd say, well, you know, we ask, we ask technical experts and they say they're not interested. So, you know, there we are, there's my proof. So I think L&D, um, you know, have a little bit of uh, responsibility here to think outside the square and what have you. And of course, learning and development team by and large get given budgets um, actually to um, deliver leadership programs. They certainly don't get given budgets to um, deliver expertship programs or work with technical experts in these areas. And most of the technical education that goes on is owned by the technical departments. Those budgets are owned by the technical departments um, uh, themselves. So, um, you know, quite often L&D teams will say, well, it's not part of my mandate and I'm not funded for it. So why should I be, why should I be worrying about it? Um, obviously, an enormous number of organisations are, are run uh, by generalists, so the senior leadership are generalists. Um, I, I alluded to a couple of technical uh, IT companies, very entrepreneurial IT companies that have very good processes around building skills of their technical experts. And of course, those very often, those organisations are run by technical experts. So, you know, surprise, surprise, there's a, there's a clear agenda and understanding. But where organisations are run by generalists, um, then, uh, you know, developing experts just doesn't seem to be important um, and uh, is certainly not funded. But I would say that the biggest culprit of all 
um, is the nine box grid. And, um, you know, I'd be very interested in getting your, your views um, about how you feel about this. So for those of you, uh, I'm sure looking at um, the sort of list of people on the grid, I'm sure most of you would know what an iBox grid is, but it's a tool that's used by talent teams um, to figure out who to invest in. And um, typically, um, the, you know, the grid has nine boxes, no surprise. Um, so um, we've got, you know, the um, high performers. So this is potential down the bottom, low, medium, high, and it's performance up this way. And, and so... The phrase green pool comes from these three squares where you've got, you know, rising stars and, and um, uh, agile high performers and so on. And then there's, there's uh, typically, um, um, you know, the, the red uh, boxes, which is people who, you know, low performance and low potential. So they're a termination risk and inconsistent performer. Um, there's a group of people in the middle who are solid performers, core performers, potential gems, you know, so they've got potential, but they're not currently high performing. And on the vast majority, I'd say 85% of the um, nine box grids that you see on Google, if you just go and search for nine box grid, about 90, 80, 90% of them have this box here called professional subject expert. Um, and of course, the problem with this is that um, what we're really saying is that um, the talent teams are basically saying we've got a box for subject matter experts, technical experts, which says they've got low potential. And the damage that this chart and this grid has done to technical expert development um, around the world is extraordinary. And, um, you know, one of our recommendations is dump it, dump it as quickly as you possibly can, um, or at least make some fundamental changes to it. Um, so from my perspective, the definition of potential in here is wrong. Um, and of course, the definition of potential for most talent teams that use the nine box grid is the potential to lead more people in one year or two years time. So it's about potential is defined as the ability for indiv individual employees to lead people. It's about finding leaders. And um, really, the definition, if you really wanted to be um, properly diverse in terms of our thinking, should really be about what is it, you know, who has the potential to create new value for the organization. Now, that value could be in leading bigger teams, but it could also be coming up with the latest innovation or a breakthrough invention or, you know, a new system that creates incredible efficiency or new ways to reach out to new markets. There's a whole range of ways that um, you can add new value. And indeed, technical subject matter experts are adding new value to their organizations every day. Um, but on this grid, it doesn't show up. And as a consequence of that, where all the funding goes is the people in the green pool. If you change the definition, then a lot of the people that are in this yellow box at the top here would move across into the, into the green um, stages. Um, I, I wonder whether anybody has any thoughts um, about that. <clears throat> So a number of you are sort of saying there are, um, um, I think, uh, Sharam, you, you're saying that um, you've used this grid. Be interested to, you know, get, get a sense from people as to, um, you know, whether they think it's being inclusive using this grid and particularly the definition of potential being inclusive to the, all of the employees in the organisation or, or just a group. So my, um, unless there are uh, any questions, um, Satila, I might just go on to, um, you know, what the solution is. And, and um, really the solution is to have um, a, a talent model um, in exactly the same way as you would for leadership. Um, but it has to be actually different when you're dealing with technical subject matter experts. So uh, as an example, um, I'll come back to you in a second, Arun. Um, as an example, uh, most organisations we, we work with actually don't have any definitions on their HR system as to who is a technical expert and who isn't. So actually identifying, um, uh, you know, this is a, a, a really, uh, it's, a, it's a fundamental informational problem. Um, then you have to ask yourself potential for what, you know, what, what, what sort of value can you create through expertise? Um, you have to filter for potential. Um, and then once you've got your hypos um, defined, then you can go on and, and grow their potential in this way. And um, then, um, 
if we just come down to um, the problem of identifying experts with potential, um, there are these sort of inbuilt problems that we, we generally have. So I, I mentioned before that the expert contribution is undervalued. I mentioned that there's some, some selection bias that comes in um, and, you know, there are misaligned systems. Um, but then you come to um, this, this potential model, which is the one that we've developed for experts. And there's a, there's a fundamental challenge, I think, for most talent teams um, to really um, think slightly differently here. So you can see that we've got three circles here. We've got personal markers, you know, what sort of um, descriptors are we looking for in terms of the experts that might suggest they've got potential, um, you know, that they believe they can add more value, they look like they can, you know, they're, they're attracted to very complex and difficult problems. So all of those things suggest they have the potential to add more value and they want to do so and they're committed to do so. Organisational markers are that they're in really critical, mission critical functions inside the organisation. So you can imagine if you're a, you know, an agri-science business, you know, your scientists and your agricultural scientists and environmental scientists are unbelievably important in terms of um, growing, um, growing your organisation's capability, whether it's a government department or, or um, a commercial enterprise. But, but the one um, that's really interesting for us, and it's probably our biggest lesson, um, is that there are erroneous markers. So if you think about how talent teams around the world would look at their organization and say, who might be great leaders of the future? They're likely to say, well, they have high emotional intelligence. Um, they're very good with people. They get on with everybody. Um, they, 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 they have a broad network and, and um, you know, connect with broadly across their organization. So they're very good at building relationships and maintaining stakeholder relationships. And they're ambitious. You can see that they want to grow, they want to learn. Um, they always sign up for the leadership programs and what have you, and they're always keen to try and get promoted. And you can understand if talent teams for many, many years, decades, have been looking for those characteristics um, in terms of what potential means, when they see experts with these erroneous markers that lack emotional intelligence, are quite abrasive with stakeholders, they're currently operating in their technical bubble, and they don't appear to be much interested in connecting with the rest of the organisation, and they have no ambition to be a people leader whatsoever, you can understand why talent teams um, feel like some groups of experts have no potential. They have no potential to be a leader, people leader. But what we've discovered is that these, these four bullet points that we put on this uh, grid here um, are actually probably highly indicative of um, a fact that the expert is quite irritated and frustrated and has a lot of ability to add more value. In other words, these are, these are attributes of someone who has the potential to do a much greater job inside their organization. Um, and yet it looks completely the opposite if you've been looking just for, for leadership. Um, Aran, I think you put your hand up. Did you want to um, did you want to make a comment or ask a question? Yes, I'll just unmute him if you would like to ask a question. Please feel free, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, to me, this uh, looks um, uh, quite opposite of when I mean, somebody is performing um, uh, performance is very good high performance person um, but uh, working at a low potential now um, I, I, I'm using example from the industry I worked in IT industry throughout and if, if we say somebody like uh, I'm using a technical expert uh, enterprise architect who is uh, capable of developing or uh, the enterprise architecture for an organ potential organization or the customer organization. Now he's already performing at the uh, uh, at a very high level uh, of his full potential. Uh, although he may, uh, when I'm talking about, I'm thinking of few people who were, could be aggressive, maybe emotionally um, not intelligent enough, but then in terms of uh, the performance, they are probably performing the peak performance. Now, what you we can uh, 
do with the what you what I've heard is that maybe putting giving some inputs on emotional intelligence, you can move them laterally towards uh, developing other people is one yes. which I see a scope of improvement uh, among them and uh, maybe uh, working as a domain expert uh, at the industry level is when they can guide the industry in terms of the potential models and other things is the second lateral shift uh, probably if in the nine box model uh, uh, these two next to adjoining ones uh, would be these but uh, yes. the question i was thinking of they're already working at it um well, well, high course, potential yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and i think the the job that you've described which is you know enterprise architect um which requires long-term strategic thinking. Um, it requires someone who um, absolutely has the ability to talk to lots of different departments. Um, we've worked with quite a lot of enterprise architects. I'm just thinking of a large bank in the UK where there were, there were two or three enterprise architects. Interestingly enough, um, they were already quite good communicators and what have you, but when it came to solutioning, they their view was to their their modus operandi if you like and was to impose their architectural solution on the rest of the organization and you know where where they found um you know attending these programs and having and having a having a broader view of market context was was helpful was they they significantly improved um their discovery process if you like um uh, you know, they, they instead of telling people, they started asking lots of questions and they found that they got very quickly instead of, you know, imposing their solution. And it was a bit of an arm wrestle. It was really hard to, you know, it was an argument to persuade Department X to, you know, you need to sign up to, you know, the architecture that we, and my, my team has decided. Um, they found that as soon as they started asking questions and were a lot more curious um, and demonstrated, yes, some emotional intelligence, but also demonstrated you know, an ability to um, articulate strategic intent and discover strategic intent, then they found that they got buy-in to their solutions, you know, much faster. They also found that they were able to adapt their solutions positively on the basis of the feedback they got. So even people that apparently are operating at a pretty high level, and I think your, your, your choice of that job title is a very good one because those people have to be pretty good um, um, to be architects in the first place. Um, but, uh, you know, we found that they were able to significantly elevate their impact, make their work easier, help explain their work to people more effectively, um, just with really a, a small amount of nurture. And as we, as most of you said, you know, it's nature versus nurture. Once, once they understand the, the tools that they can use to actually, um, you know, communicate better and, and manage stakeholders better and and describe and articulate strategic intent better, um, then you know that they they get a huge amount of it out of it and it, and it moves forward significantly. Re really want to thank you for your comment, Aaron. That's great. Um, so, <clears throat> um, you know, we're, we're talking about some of these difficulties um, about you know developing master. I'd like to come to sort of questions. I'm aware of the time. Uh, questions in a moment. There are. You know, again, there are these sort of problems when you're beginning to develop these types of activities inside your organizations or with your clients, depending on what your scenario, or indeed you're trying to develop these skills yourself as an expert. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of experts who don't move beyond their comfortable performance level. Um, they're very comfortable. They're, they're perceived as experts by the group around them. Um, and as I mentioned before, they already think they're the finished article. So that's a, that's a problem. Ad hoc learning on the job, you know, is not effective for expertise. It needs to be planned and structured and really well thought through. And it's, you know, the journey to mastery is quite a long journey. And for a lot of experts, they're having to completely change muscle memory in terms of what they're doing. Um, it's it is perceived to be expensive um, and it takes a lot longer to develop than um, traditional leadership. And, you know, we, we've tried to move away from the word, the phrase soft skills, um, although this is, of course, what the world calls them, um, because it's not just about interpersonal skills. It's about um, change and transformation leadership. It's about understanding the market context in which your community organization or your commercial organization operates. 
Um, you know, it, it's around understanding where value can be created. Um, it's being, you know, highly sensitive to customers or client or community, um, you know, beliefs and what have you. So um, this expertise, that's why we call them enterprise skills, um, as applicable in the public sector and the private sector. But, um, you know, we really dislike the phrase soft skills because it sounds like they're not important. And indeed, some technical experts will will use the term soft skills as a derogatory rather than, a, than a, you know, as a positive. And, and quite often experts will need to be motivated to, you know, develop their own expertise. I, I thought I would just share with you the typical sort of um, curriculum that connects back into that capability framework. Obviously, we do work with them on their technical skills in terms of knowledge management, knowledge transfer, um, you know, how to curate and um, keep refreshed their expert knowledge. Um, but all of these other areas, um, which some of which will seem very similar to a leadership program, but um, one of our advice and pieces of advice for you would be, you've got to approach it from the perspective of an expert. Um, and, you know, experts tend to work on multiple projects in multiple teams, very often multiple countries. Um, this is why prioritization is one of the things when they, when they build their personal growth plans um, off the back of um, attendance at some of these programs, you know, the, the things that always are on their um, personal growth plans is prioritization. How do I work on the, how do I spend the right amount of time working on the right things for the right reasons, as opposed to just working for the noisiest stakeholders? Um, how do I manage my stakeholder engagement? How do I change my brand from this sort of closed um, sort of technical expert into someone who's broader? Um, you know, what is my role in innovation? You know, how do I, uh, how do I become a coach? You know, how do I influence non-technical senior people without dumbing down what I'm saying too much? All of these are the sorts of things that, you know, we describe in the, in the program um, and we come through. And, and I guess I should sort of kind of finish by saying, you know, what does Kim 2.0 look like? And, um, you know, the reason I would really, really love to encourage you to explore what you could do differently for technical subject matter experts in your organizations and in your client groups, and indeed if you are an expert, is the outcomes are extraordinary. Like um, I've run a lot of leadership development programs and we've all had that situation where at the end of the program, everyone said it was great. And you know they, they come up with a, a list of things that they're going to change behaviors that, that's gonna elevate their leadership impact and, and off they go and, and um, you know, maybe 50 or 60% of them actually do make some of those changes. But with technical experts, once they realize there's a higher level of expertise that they can aspire to, wow, they go at it with military precision. Um, we have enormously high outcomes, not because our training is brilliant, um, but because we've opened their eyes to their opportunities to have more influence and have more impact in their organization which they've already aspired to, and indeed generate more kudos um, to them. And this is what happened with Kim. Um, you know, he's now 20 years, 10 years, still at the same company. Um, you know, he's now, you know, he's close to a master expert. If, if, if he was on the call, he, he would say he isn't because he, he's got a big long list of things he wants to be better at. He's completely changed his personal brand from being, you know, acerbic and, and occasionally aggressive and occasionally, um, you know, um, uh, a little bit upset with with non technical stakeholders, you know he's he's now you know perceived as thoughtful and nurturing. Um, he's you know he spends a lot of time working with people who have less knowledge explaining things. He spent a lot of time figuring out how to explain things so that they understand it properly and he's not dumbing it down. But um, you know they're using the right language. A lot of versioning he does. You know he's he's calmer. He's stabler. He's happier. Uh, more fulfilled, he's trusted by management, um, and um, you know he's a he's a huge advocate for the for the program, and he's still unfireable. Like you know, the CIO who hires him would absolutely not want to get rid of him. But but now it's um, you know he's unfireable for all the positive reasons that he's such a he's such a positive contributor, and you can see from um, you know this slide here the, the the change from narrow specialist to master expert. You know, you're moving from technician to colleague, from supplier to partner. You know, all of these things are easy to write in the list. But if you really think about 
how experts are being experienced by their clients, um, then um, you know the opportunities for them to add more value, have more self worth, contribute more to their organisation um, is extraordinary. It's, it's been I had to be honest with you all. I've done a lot of leadership development training, but the expertship stuff is easily the most fulfilling and exciting work that I've done in the last 20 years because you're giving people an opportunity to change their lives, not just at work, but, but also um, at home. So I might finish off by um, asking for some questions. Just, um, you know, call to action. If, if you're an expert, there are these sort of um, things that you can buy. This is a book how to be a master expert, which is, you know, pretty much the course in the book. The Expertship Growth Guide is also a development guide for, one of the things that we discovered is that experts are not very good at writing personal growth plans. Um, they are very good at writing them for technical acquisition skills, but when it comes to enterprise skills, they really don't know where to start. So we've written a book with 102 suggestions as to how they could do it. So those are available to anyone who's out there who's an expert. If um, you're a learning professional, we, we, we're we very keen to share. So expertunity.global is where you'll find a lot of um, materials. Um, we, we encourage you to delete the nine box grid or as I think um, um, somebody was saying a little earlier on, um, uh, you know, I think uh, if you change the definition of what potential is, it may, it's just totally transformative in terms of, um, you know, how you begin to respect subject matter experts and how you invest in them. Engage with technical heads. You know, if you have a CEO or a CFO or a head of risk and what have you, they will totally understand what you're talking about straight away. Um, and, um, you know, because I'm, uh, I'm slightly entrepreneurial, I said, don't think about it, just do it is my piece of advice. And if you are a technical head on this on this call, again, there's there's lots of um, materials on, on our website. Our, our objective here is, you know, we have a, a growing number of clients that we're working with in this space, but one of the exciting things about being invited to do this presentation is that I'm talking to people from all over the world and you can start helping your technical experts in, in country right where you are, you know, right now. And we're very happy to support and um, you in doing that in terms of sharing our materials and, and uh, most of most of our IP. So, um, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to um move forward and I, I might stop there um Satulu, and see if there's any questions or criticisms or anything else that people have uh, contributed 